All right. Uh, hello, everybody. It's The Drinker here this evening, and uh, I hope you're all having a lovely day so far. Uh, it's been a pretty interesting uh, day or two for me. As you're probably all aware, we launched the first trailer for Rogue Elements, and it seems to have gone down pretty well so far. So um, I guess for most of you, this is your first tangible glimpse of uh, what we've been working on for the past year or so. It's obviously been a lot of stuff going on in the background. Uh, a lot of stuff that we couldn't really share with you until it was ready. And we're now at the point where we can actually start sharing stuff and um, hopefully you're enjoying it. But it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts more as we go through the stream. Um, but we've uh, we've got some excellent news as well. Um, we've got a bunch of people that are going to be on this stream tonight. Um, and one of the biggies is going to be John Kassar, who's, uh, who's a very well-known producer and director in Hollywood. But uh, I will get to him in just a moment. First of all, I'm going to bring in uh, the director of Rogue Elements and the man who helped cut together the trailer. It is the one and only Travis Grants. Hello. Welcome back, man. Thanks it's, for having me on. No, it's great to have you back, man. And uh, it's probably been quite a while since the people have seen you on the main channel because we've done all these streams, but they've usually been for the Kickstarter backers and so on to yeah, update them on our in progress. The, in, the, in the shadows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's great to be doing this live now in front of everyone. So it's uh, it's nice to be able to finally share all the hard work that you've been doing over the past year. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been nerve wracking having this just kind of bubble up and bubble up, and then to finally release it uh, yesterday was uh, just like a big like weight off the shoulders. Round one of showing what we've been doing for the last little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you never quite know how it's going to go down, but it seems like people have enjoyed it so far. So, um, yeah, people are saying, I'm not wearing my sunglasses. I know that's how serious this is, you see. I'm taking it seriously tonight. Uh, anyway, next up, we've got uh, the the man who helped to hold this entire project together while we were um, getting ready to shoot uh, and also played an excellent role in the, the film itself. It is Carson Manning. Hey. Hi, man. How are you doing, Good guys? To have you back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We love it. You've kept your your Fedorov beard as well. So well done. Yeah, I've, I've, I've neatened them. I'm neatened them up a little bit. Just a little. Yeah, bit. yeah. <laughs> no, um, for everyone who's uh, who didn't, you know, obviously follow us through the Kickstarter backer and so on. Um, Carson is one of the producers on Rogue Elements. Um, he helped to to really bring the whole project together and, and brought in so many of the people that we needed to make this project happen. Um, and help, even helped by filling in for one of the roles on set. So that was excellent. <laughs> um, so yeah, great to have you back. And uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and last up, we have got um, our main guest this evening. Um, he has joined the project. He's joined Rogue Elements. Um, you will probably know him as the one of the producers and directors of 24, and before that, La Femme Nikita, uh, and a whole bunch of other projects over the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's my great pleasure to bring on John Kassar. Welcome to the, the live stream, sir. Hi. Hi. How's everyone doing today? It's good. We are pretty good. We're pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I got to say, it's great to have you on and it's great to have you on board with Rogue Elements. So thank you for, for helping us out with this. And I'm very excited. Up. Very, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm virtually a, a very late entry into this, into this project, but Carson and I can go way back. I think uh, too far back, we even say, uh, <laughs> yeah. and so and friends for a while. And, and he was the one that introduced me to this and, I took to it right away, and that the, the reasons are probably obvious why why I, I took to it right away because uh, it's very twenty four like. Yeah, no, I was saying to you just backstage there. Um, you know, I've I was a fan of twenty four since the very first season. It was like two thousand and one, two thousand and two. Um, been following it ever since. Watched every season of it, and uh, it was part of the inspiration for the Ryan Drake series in the first place. So to now have you here and be working with you, it's it's a real honor, man. Um, it's a a little bit of life coming full circle for me, so it's a, quite a cool feeling. <laughs> yeah, life does that. It does come full circle every once in a while, and sometimes not good, but I think this is a good time. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, absolutely. Um, I guess I was just going to start, like, you know, to give people the, the benefit of uh, understanding what your career's been like and, and the things that you've worked on. Um, it's my understanding that La Femme Nikita was one of the big um, things early on for you, um, and I certainly remember it. it definitely felt like an early precursor to 24 um, because it was Peter Wilson who started in that, wasn't it? Peter Wilson, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I liked well, that back in the day. Well, it's, it's got, a, it's got a, a direct connection to 24 because, first of all, it was one of the first pilots I did. I did the pilot for Le Femme Nikita. Uh, I took to it really quickly because I was a huge Luc Bisson fan. 
and knew the I knew the film inside out, and and I wanted to make it that film. There was an American version too, I think, called Point and Over mm-hmm. with Bridget mm-hmm. Fonda, and I remember seeing that one, thinking, no, that's not it. I want the Luc Besson version, and that's kind of what I uh, stylized it and and made the the television Le Femme Nikita. Uh, look for it. and it was it was way ahead of its time quite honestly it was on usa network you can grab an episode today and look at it and it looks like it was shot yesterday like it yeah. really has that kind of feel of, of like what what was about to happen to television put it that way and mm-hmm. you know usa was great for giving us the chance and the freedom to do what we did on that show uh the showrunner uh was uh the same guy that virtually did 24 <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's that's my connection uh, Joel Cernow is his name, and and here's the best story of all. I remember one day sitting on the set, and he said, "So I've got this new project coming up, and and it's going to be really cool. It's kind of like this. It's in this world, you know, t- anti-terrorism and that kind of thing." He said, "But it's going to take place in real time, so every minute's a minute." And I just thought about it for a second. And I thought, "Gee, you know, it's like the cops waiting outside for the bad guys to come out and sitting in their car in real time." And, going up the elevator in real time and i looked at my i thought joel i you know i don't want to discourage you here but that's a really bad idea i I don't i think that's going to just be so slow and of course what did i know because it became one of the fastest moving shows on television yeah so thank god he didn't thank god he didn't listen to from to me quite honestly and then (laughs) and then basically you know he in the first season he called me in to do two episodes i did two episodes i think in the middle of the season around 11 and 12 was season one uh and uh and then they asked me to come in as producer director full time and that was the next seven years of my life so it, mm-hmm. it was uh yeah it, it there's always a connection basically and it even goes further back than that because i got la femme nikita because i did baywatch nights so there ah. you go and so when, you know, when people are saying, oh, that job's too small, that job's too small, I always tell people I have a huge career because of Baywatch Nights. So there Fair you play. go. Fair you play. Know, you never know. Because, you know, someone there talked to Joel. Joel gave me a chance because I did well on Baywatch Nights. And then I got 24, and that kind of solidified, a you know, a pretty successful career for me. Yeah, I mean, well, like you say, like, there never been anything quite like 24 before that, that idea of doing it in real time. And... Man, when I think about it now, if it really harkens back to a different era in television where you had series that were 24 episodes or 22 episodes long. Now right. they're like yeah. 10 at most, you know, so such a different way of doing things. But it never felt like it dragged. There was always so much going on. They, they were so good at interweaving so many different characters, so many different plot threads simultaneously that you always felt like it was rocketing forward. And there was just kind of never a dull moment. And I like that. I like that aspect of it. And the, the whole... Um, techno thriller aspect the the anti-terrorism stuff it, it all just um it really appealed to me like it wasn't as over as like a you know soldiers on the front line fighting right. war uh, but it wasn't just a procedural cop drama it was this kind of in between where there was lots of action but there was lots of um, political maneuvering there was lots of intrigue uh, and mm-hmm. it all just married together perfectly I, I really enjoyed that about the show and it's um, it really felt like it was part of that golden age of TV where, damn, we've got like movie stars like Kiefer Sutherland on a TV yeah. show now. One of the um, first ones, quite honestly, to, to, you know, one of the first sort of movie stars to go to take a chance at television. Uh, mm-hmm. it, look, it had it had a lot of things going for it. And the timing was one of those weird things that happened in the world. And that's, you know, 9-11 mm-hmm. happened while they were shooting the, in the first season. I wasn't there yet. But there's we put out a picture book at 24, like behind the scenes that the crew took pictures of. And one of the pictures is the crew stopped shooting on the CTU set watching 9-11 happening. Wow. And in the first in the first episode, we had a, a plane blowing up. We had a CGI of a plane blowing up and they, you know, they cut that out in the first episode. And Fox, I got to tell you, had a lot of guts to bring that show out right after 9-11. Because at that time, I don't know if everybody remembers this, there was this like, we'll never do anything, we'll never do action again, we'll never kill anybody in movies and television again, it's all going to be flowers and love and beautiful, and, you know, some shows got cancelled, I think there was an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that got put on hold, like, yeah, he was doing that, and here comes Fox and going, here, we got an anti-terrorist show on the air, right after 9-11, and quite honestly, it was that fear that you know that we were all feeling to get on a plane again. The first time I got on a plane to after 9/11 was to go do 24. So how strange is that? Wow. And you know all of that fear 
that we were all feeling kind of fed right into the show. And so it manifested what we felt every week watching that show. I think there was almost a desire to see shows like that. Maybe it was like cathartic for people or whatever, but um, maybe a desire to see the the good guys taking on threats like that. Because the, yeah. the shows often like tackled things like Islamic terrorism and stuff, but it took it um, it took it very seriously and it didn't feel like it was just trying to like score points or whatever. Like it was quite well rounded out from a from a writing point of view. Um but maybe you know, people took comfort in that. I don't know. Sides. It didn't it didn't, you know, it's funny because because in the political world we were we were a favorite show. I mean, Obama loved the show. There's so many different people. We were invited to the White House. It was crazy how many politicians love the show, but amazingly enough, from both sides of the of the house. So <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was pretty amazing. You know, the Republicans loved it as much as you know the, the Democrats did. So we that was a good sign for us. We obviously we showed, I mean, look, you can see by our presidents who were the ones that were supposed to be Republican and who were the ones that were supposed to be mm. Democratic. You can see by the president, the different presidents we had. And so, yeah, that, that was that was a part of part of that show, too. It was interesting, too, because if you when I talked to the guys about, you know, coming up with the idea and, and you know, the, the early stages of it, they they virtually thought they were doing James Bond. They, they, they thought it was this kind of over the top spy thriller you know, and and I think again, 9/11. Suddenly, it didn't look over the top. Suddenly, it looked like what was happening out there every day. And so, yeah. it's not. It's they didn't go in in it that way. They went in it to do the, like a high end kind of fun spy, not not fun, but kind of over the top spy thriller. And then suddenly, we we were kind of the most realistic thing on TV in in a yeah. strange way. So it's amazing the nucleus of it. I, I suppose as well, there must have been a real challenge each season to come up with a new threat because, you know, over the course of, of all the various seasons, you have like uh, nuclear threats, you have biological weapons, you got chemical warfare, like there's kind of, I think there's cyber attacks and stuff. So you must run the whole gamut of, of like global threats like when it comes well, to each season. <laughs> yeah, we're the playbook for, you know, how to terrorize America, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's really interesting because because first of all, it was a couple of things. After the first season, first of all, the first season was it was going to be a wedding. It was going to be 24 hours in the life of a wedding. And everyone <laughs> kind of went, there's no real there's no real tension in that. <laughs> and they, they had all sorts of different ideas. And then they came up with this. Uh, amazingly enough, again, with the timing. And then after the first year, I remember Joel looking, you know, telling me, because I started in the second season in the process of putting it together and all that. And he he was just saying, we had no idea what to do. We, we didn't know if we were going to do the same characters. One of the ideas was like, let's let's make it an anthology where we have all the same actors, but now they're all doctors in an oh, okay. emergency for 24 hours. And the next time they're all like, people on a boat, like just all these crazy ideas of using the same actors. And so they really didn't even have a clue. And then they were like, all right, let's just keep doing this, I guess. Let's let's keep doing, you know, let's come up with another story. And and we had, you know, some of the most original writers and and what they were doing was, any writer will tell you, was a high wire act because when you're doing 24 episodes a year, it's almost an 11 month production schedule, which means you have no writing time. You, you, when I finished my last show, because I, I did the finales and the and the openings, you know, shows of every year, I would have three weeks off. For seven years, I had three weeks off in between seasons. And when I was directing the last episode, they were already pitching me what the next season was going to be. And I'd be like, dude, really? <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> for 10 months. Let me just like think about this last episode, please. So it was truly a high wire act. And they didn't have an, you know, they'll admit this. They didn't have a plan for the whole season. They were writing as they went along, you know, and they would come to me and I would like read a script and go, wow, this is crazy. Like, how the hell is Jack Bauer going to get out of this one? And they would look at me, oh, we don't know. You got any ideas? You know, it's like, well, we're shooting it like next week. So, so it really was truly, they, they always said it was a high wire act. At any point, they could have fallen down and failed miserably. But somehow they kept those balls in the air and and it got done. It's it pretty amazing what they did. Well, I, I like the I really obviously appreciate the fact that they didn't go with the anthology idea and they, they decided to carry on with like a yeah, continuous story because yeah. so many of those characters just became fan favorites. Obviously, everyone loved Jack Bauer right. because he's That's cool, right. but um 
you know, like characters like Chloe, who were like really quirky and different, but like yeah. she just kept, you know, growing on people over the course of the the show. It was great to see them, and like these characters did develop over time because, you know, it ended up spanning quite a long period of time, and you know, well, as a result, that's, that's also the, you know, look, all good shows are based on uh, basically who the writer is and and the writing team, and and I'll never forget Joel said, "Come on, we got to meet this actress today," and and. We went up to our, our casting room because we did everything in the one building, which was a real plus for us. And uh, and and Mary Lynn Rice kept walked in and we chatted with her for a while and she was kind of quirky. And then she's about to leave and she said, what part is this for? And Joel, looked at, Joel first <laughs> looked at her. I had no idea either. And Joel looked at her and said, well, I have no idea. He said, I, just, I saw you in a movie with an Adam Sandler movie. He saw her in an Adam Sandler movie. He said, I just like you. And, and I think you're just going to be a good fit for the show. Just stay tuned. We're going to write you a part, and that's basically how <laughs> that's it came cool. down. So, so Chloe is Chloe because it's virtually based on Mary Lynn herself. So there, there you go. That's a, an interesting way to do it. But yeah, all the you know Tony Almeida and, and all the characters became you know, and and we carried them from season to season. And that's the other thing that people don't realize is that back in back in that day, there weren't a lot of continuing storylines on television. They didn't really exist yet. They were just beginning. You know, loss was another one, but but they they came after us. So we were one of the first because because again, television wasn't built that way. It was built to have you know individual episodes. So when you could you sold them back to the networks for reruns, they could play them in any order, and you never had to play them in order. So in fact, England, the UK became bigger fans first than they did in America because in the UK they were used to continuing storylines. Almost all the dramas had continuing storylines. Yeah. The way they make TV in England. But in America, it wasn't like that. So it took a big chance just doing that for, for you know, number one. You know, it was like, wait, you have to watch every episode every week. This is new. You know, and then obviously right after us, a whole bunch of shows started coming out that way. So, again, they were breaking, you know, new ground. And that's, I think, one of the appeals for people is that they couldn't miss it. They had to watch it. You know, and again, we didn't, there weren't, there wasn't streaming yet. There wasn't any of that. And in fact, we were the very first show to bring <laughs> out the DVDs before the season started. We, no one had done that yet. We right. were the very first show because we wanted people to know who the characters were because we were continuing the story. So, so we were the very first show. At the time you had like, you know, X-Files, which had been off the air. You had Star Trek on DVD. You had all these shows that were, off the air for years and they were on DVD, but we were the first ones to say, no, watch these, watch the DVDs first and then come watch the second season. So we we're the first ones to do that. Oh, that's cool. I've got to ask as well, are <laughs> are we ever going to find out what happened to Jack Bauer? Because like the last time I saw him, he was on a helicopter getting carted off to Russia. He's, he's, he's not, he's in probably in bad condition right now. He's, like, <laughs> he's, he's been in prison for 10 years. You know, and, and being in jail in Russia nowadays doesn't end well. <laughs> yeah. <as> you know. <laughs> As unfortunately, you know, with what happens oh. there. So, yeah, that's it. And of course, huge the fan base. I mean, if my, the, you know, any article comes out about 24, and even if Kiefer says maybe in an er interview, the, uh, you know, the internet explodes of like, when's 24 coming back? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just, it's got such appeal. And I feel like now more than ever, like, man, I feel like a show like that would just kick ass again because. Yeah, it's because the world needs Jack Bauer right now. There's no doubt. It does. Oh, and yeah. It just, it needs cool action heroes like that. Um, and I feel like you're, you're starting to see elements of it with things like um, the terminal list, you know, with Jack Reacher. You know, I, I know they're, they're in, you know, Reacher's in a slightly different realm, but it's the same concept of like, yeah, and, concept. you know. Yeah. fighting terrorism all that sort of thing it's like, it isn't it's, any different than the gunslinger walking into the town that is corrupt and fixing everything you know it, yeah. it goes back and if you can go back further than that and go go to the samurai you know go mm -hmm. to the seven samurai which is really you know the 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 idea for magnificent seven so i mean it, it goes back in in sort of our historical storytelling to have that one guy that comes in and saves the day you mm -hmm. know yeah. Um, I, I know as well. You you worked on um, like once twenty four was finished. You you worked on Terra Nova as well, which is mm. like sci fi. Uh, it was like a time travel show, wasn't it? Where they they went yeah. back to like the age of the dinosaurs. I do remember watching that because that like the it was such a huge production. Like the huge. the investment in it was massive. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, it was, it was, and it was again a fan favorite around the world. But unfortunately, it just didn't get the numbers of Fox, to ex especially because our our budget was so high. We shot it in Australia on the Gold Coast, which was kind of interesting and fun. Uh, Jason O'Meara was in it. I mean, a lot of great people. Uh, Stephen Lang was fantastic. Yeah, basically, yeah. basically doing the same thing he did in Avatar. Uh, and not and quite as evil had, this time had, around, though. <laughs> Spielberg. Spielberg was my main producer on that. I mean, it was a, it was a Spielberg production, and and. And actually, I've always said that if you really watch a show, there's a couple of scenes in there that you can see later in some of the in some of the uh, uh, Jurassic Park films that we did first. And so, but hey, yeah. they were they were both, they were both his, so he could do whatever he wants, I guess. Yeah, but but uh, it was interesting and had had really good dinosaur CG. I mean, that, you know, there was a lot of money being spent on on that for a television show. Again, a huge fan base around the world, but in America, it just never, it never caught on. People loved it too because it was a family show. You know, our main characters was a family of five, and so that you know, from the youngest girl to teenage boy and and slightly older uh, girl, and then the parents, and so people loved it because it was one of the shows they said you would sit down and watch with your family, <laughs> unlike Twenty Four. <laughs> yeah, I, I think maybe if it come out ten years earlier, it would have been way bigger I, I think yeah, when, little, when the mania around like the, yeah like because you know at the, the the time like when jurassic park movies were like all the rage i think that would have played really well at the time i think maybe yeah. it was in between those two things because like it jurassic was. world was still a long way away so yeah it perhaps yeah, like yeah. wasn't quite the right time for it well it was um, it was in it was in in the mind of of amblin and and uh and spielberg i think because uh they wouldn't let us shoot in hawaii that's why we went to they were trying oh. to save hawaii for the the, what they said at the time were the new Jurassic Park. So that's, they obviously were thinking about that already. They didn't want to burn sort of the look of Hawaii because that's where they shot the originals. Yeah. Uh, fair so way. ended up in Australia. Um, yeah. Well, they've got plenty of jungle out there, though. So it's yeah. nice. It's not and, a bad place to shoot, I'd imagine. And that one back. I could probably, you know, just spend the rest of my career just bringing back shows I've done already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, uh, you know, Look into like the, the present day. Obviously, you've uh, you've decided to come on board and help out with Rogue Elements, and um, mm -hmm. I guess I'd be interested to know, you know, what's uh, what interested you in the project and what your thoughts are on it, because this is kind of the the first real opportunity we've had to chat about it. So, um, well, the first first thing I did when when Carson called me about it is obviously I got the book, I got Redemption, the first one, and I'm going to work my way through most of them and. And I got to tell you, that didn't take me long to read that one. It, it's really, it's really quite <laughs> good. And of course, that elements of twenty four that I recognized right away. But again, just really well written, really well written, really great storytelling, very descriptive storytelling. And you know, and when Carson came in, and, and so that's number one. So already, I thought there was a good, uh, good basis. And he's written so many books, so the IP is great. You know, and and when you're looking for a TV series, the studios want to know. Do you have enough story to, to to you know to go five years? They're they're never thinking. Let's just do six episodes. They're thinking how can we how can we make money on this? The longer we have it, the more money we make. So they want you know to have stories that they know can go for a long time. So that's already you know attractive. And then and then it's the people. Like I like Carson and I, I the people you've put together. I know some of the actors that that worked in the trailer. Mike Dupont is one of them. I just had lunch with them the other day. We were he was here in New York City. So. At my at my age and this late in my career, it's about the people. You know, what the story needs to be good, but it's exactly. about the people. It really, it truly is that. And anyone that's been in this business long enough will tell you that. And and putting together the right team, and and so so you're doing something really good, and you're you're having fun doing it. And that's kind of when it's how Twenty Four works. It's how most of the shows I, I I do work. That's kind of what I look for first. <laughs> And then let's all together, you know, have a laugh, but tell a really good story and do good work. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I mean, we, we had so much fun, like, with the, the making of this. Uh, at least I did. Like, Travis actually had a full head of hair when he started yeah. it. This, <laughs> yeah. you know? I, I, I feel for you, Travis. I feel for yeah. you. I can still grow a few over here on the side. Yeah. I, got lots. I can give you some of mine. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Uh, no, but the, the atmosphere, like when when we were making this, like it was such a, a positive vibe about the whole thing. You know, yeah. like um, it was at a time when the the strikes were go. on, so there was a lot um, that wasn't getting done. Um, and yet, like the people there, just yeah, we're in the middle of the seemed like no. yeah, they were super invested in it, and they were doing it um, for for very little money because we had very little budget to be able to to spend on them. But they were willing to do it, and they were willing to pitch in. 
uh, and really go above and beyond. And I, I so respected that and really appreciated the work that they all put in, um, and, and especially Travis and, and Carson and Max and Bjorn. Like these guys were just going the extra mile every day. Um, and it was great to see. Yeah, and, and that shows you what kind of people they are right away. And that's sort of, you know, what interests me, the fact that I saw what I saw and I knew that you guys did it sort of yourselves without any, any, any help. That's pretty amazing. You know, and that already sort of, to me, indicated it's the kind of project I'd, I'd love to help out on. It's, it's, that's, I'm just here to help, you know, to use whatever I can of my notoriety to help get this thing made. Thank you. No, but John, we, we also, we, I mean, it happened at a good time for us in a sense when we were doing that. It, you know, it was unfortunate we had a SAG strike, but at the same time, for our benefit, it helped. We have a lot of Canadian SAG actors as myself as well, but because we're under the Canadian, we could go ahead and shoot that. I mean, we wish everybody was working. So, it, yeah, so we, we actually got, so it was going on, Steven Spielberg. I mean, um, uh, it uh, what was the other show, but a lot of the ADs came over. And helped us a lot of the people okay. that you would have known a lot of from the mute next days and things like that so oh, they yeah. came over and max sure. and max sure. uh, max also says hello max has gone on since you met max back on mute next he's gone on to a stunt coordinate all the kingsman series in the oh, uk he, oh, wow. the Excellent. Show, he's became a real force in our action so he did the action for our show and he's also getting ready to do the boys again and some other major shows and he's won several awards so he does say shout out to you and he was very happy that we talked to you and he can't he couldn't be here right now I, but I you remember know that he, no, he, he doesn't surprise me though surprise. and you were there directing yeah, yeah first time he came on set and you were directing and that was his first time in film and it was quite funny we're looking back so many memories with you you know but uh can i can i bring up one memory i hope it's not embarrassing to you now, was this on Nikita? Yeah, this, 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 is, my no, <laughs> this is relevant to our show, and Will's going to appreciate this. So I think this was a Nikita. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You you jumped in to fill in to play a character as so we're talking about terrorists again, shooting a rocket launcher. Do you remember that? Yeah, <laughs> you you nailed that rocket launcher on the target right on, and everybody was flipping out. And you do it, and the, that same rocket launcher that you shot that day—I don't know how many years ago was that? Over twenty, right? Whatever. At least twenty. Uh, yeah. Twenty is the end of twenty-four. I mean, we use we use the identical rocket launcher in our show right now. The same oh, one that you fired. Not. <laughs> it, goes to, it goes to show you how the movie business reuses things. <laughs> yeah. It shows you. It's funny because I, I I didn't do I, I've only done a handful of cameos. I think I did one on Kung Fu, and uh, I I did like a I was a picture of something. I never wanted to do it on Twenty Four because we were in the height of terrorism, and I didn't want some guy at the border to remember my face, <laughs> mix it up with whether he saw my face on a watch list or saw my face on a television <laughs> show. So, you know, and I kind of look like potentially I, I could be trouble. So, so I just, I never, I was like, no, I, I don't want to play a terrorist. Thanks. Well, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, the, you know, the, um, the fight scenes, the action and stuff that we managed to put together for Rogue Elements, um, it was great fun to see it filmed and rehearsed and so on. And, you know, mm -hmm. it gave me a, such a great appreciation for the work that has to go in, um, particularly yeah. for the stunt people. Like, mm -hmm. When you, when you see people get thrown off rooftops, um, not just once, but like five, six, seven times, it's and they just mean. bounce right up and they're ready to go again. And you think, yeah. damn, man, I don't know what you're made of, but it's not flesh and bone like me. Uh, it's, well, a, this it's is why there's a bit, This is why there's a big push to get them at the Academy Awards, which I totally, obviously, am behind. You know, there's a big push to get uh, stunt people as part of the Academy Awards, of course. I mean... They just put they just let casting in this year and you know and casting do a job too look it's a big team team job but you you how can you eliminate stunt people and what they do and what they've done for this industry it's it's not fair so hopefully the academy will come around in the next few years yeah. and we can now have, have that yeah. happen because my respect for them is endless i've worked with them you know from the very beginning of my career i just started doing action right off the top and so you know, my, my one of my first shows was uh, Kung Fu Legend Continues, you know, and I did I did all that action with David Carradine and, and that gang. And so, you know, I, that, all, that's just been most of my career is, is action. And, and I couldn't have done it without those kind of people. Yeah. No. I mean, it, it, particularly because one of the things I've advocated for a lot with my channel is um, 
sort of moving away as much as we can from CGI to, to practical effects again. And that means stunt people, pyrotechnics, the, the stuff that they used to make such great use of, because I just think it's never the same. You know, when you've got, you, you can have these two, three hundred million dollar movies with the most incredible CGI, um, you know, worlds that you can uh, conceive of. Um, but there's always that air of just it's you know it's not real and you know that the actors are just standing in a big green room and like it's just you're always disconnected from it slightly and so I I've, I've always appreciated the the use of real stunts um, real practical effects like whether it's a car chase or or whatever or explosions going off or squibs or whatever um, I love to see that and I I hope to. You know, if we were able to move forward with other things in the Ryan Drake universe to to really get back to that style of filmmaking, because I think it's just so much more visceral and immediate for the audience. I totally agree. And I just think, especially, you know, on some of the superhero movies, the action just becomes so big, it, it doesn't feel real to us. I mean, when you see a real car chase and you see real cars smash up and blow up, you can identify with that. You drive a real car every day, and that'd yeah. be a horrible thing if it happened to you. But some of the stuff now is just so over the top that it just, I don't know, it, it's not, you can't get emotionally involved. That's really what it comes down to for me. I'm mm -hmm. still a you know a big fan of that. And quite honestly, because you know I work a lot in network television that don't have the budgets that streamers have, we're still in the practical world. We have to be because we can't afford that kind of CG. And quite honestly, it's it's uh, it's a time thing. It's a time element. You know, at network TV, it's your. I mean, right now the show I'm doing now, Law and Order: Organized Crime, because it was a you know a scramble to try to get something going right after the the actors' strike. Mm -hmm. I think I think there was one of my episodes, one of the first episodes I did this year, or the the first episode, the the first episode of the season. I think we finished shooting and three weeks later. It was on the air. I mean, Damn. quick right now. That's <laughs> how fast things are, are moving, and there's no way you can do CG. It's just impossible. So that's a plus for me in, in a way because I get to do what I'm used to doing, blowing up cars and, and doing that and doing everything realistically and having stuntmen do the stunts. And so it's it's a benefit for me that way. And and look, I've done, you know, I've done big CG shows. What we did on the Orville in the last season, season four, was crazy. We were doing we were doing more effect, uh, visual effect shots in one episode than the original Star Wars, and and mm -hmm. even some of the even some of the prequels after that, we did more on one episode. Now, mind you, some of the episodes are an hour and a half long, but but <laughs> if, you know, if you go and see that show right now, you're like, this is like you know feature quality CG. But it took us a year to do that, those you know ten episodes. You know, the, you can't you can't turn them over that quickly. That's that's the, part of the problem. The, the Orville was something I was curious about, actually, because it's such an interesting show in the, the conception of it. Because I know like uh, it's Seth MacFarlane, isn't it, who's who's behind it? Comedy genius. And, Truly well, a comedy genius. He is. And I think he's a massive, like, massive Star Trek fan. Um, and I think from what he'd said about this over the years, he'd always wanted to do a Star Trek show. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't necessarily do it. They wouldn't let him do it. Um, and they wouldn't let him do just a hard sci-fi show. They, they wanted to do comedy because that's what he's always been associated with. And so you ended up with the Orville, which is like this interesting mix of comedy, but like there's actually some really interesting, serious, dramatic writing behind it as well. It's behind this veil of comedy, though, and I think you you start to get more of that that traditional Star Trekky feel as the show goes on. Um, and it's quite a, quite an interesting way it came about because when I see what Star Trek now is, a lot of people have said the Orville is actually the Star Trek. I know what we wanted like it's the, the thing that's closest to it now in tone and feel as well, opposed I mean, to like the actual Star Trek brand. You hit it right on the head. He's a Star Trek fan. And in fact, if you can go find it online, A, there's him doing a Star Trek spin, you know, a Star Trek sort of his own version with him and his teenage friends with a cardboard set. So that's how yeah. far back it goes. And then there's another clip where he's one of the the <laughs> you know, one of the guys in a Star Trek show in Next Generation. He's like a the guy that has three lines in the background. So he yeah. he goes far that, that far back and he is fanatical about the show. He knows every episode, he could tell you every every episode. And so yes, what he did, <laughs> what he did on Fox was they wanted a comedy. So he gave him a comedy and he started pulling the comedy away a little bit every year. So our last <laughs> season basically became a true sci-fi with you know a little bit of comedy. I mean it, it's 
the comedy element is the slapstick sort of comedy element is gone. There's still it's still pretty funny in a way because it's but it's more sort of grounded funny. It's not over the top. It's like, you know, guys sitting in the bridge going, hey, when's our shift over? You know, which which yeah. is kind of realistic. And the people would do that. But people don't do that in sci fi for for some reason. So. So, you know, he's done that and he's just genius. He just he writes all the episodes. Basically, he has a writing team, but we write all the episodes before we go. There's hopefully a fourth season. We're, we're crossing our fingers. I, I know he wants one. It's just a matter of sort of getting all the ducks in a row. We'd love to do another season. And uh, and yeah. And, and, you know, he just he keeps pushing the envelope as how much we can do in, in one show. It's, it's become a huge <laughs> sci-fi show that people love. But just as an example, here's a great example of, of how he loves Star Trek. Uh, one of our, our, our main writers was also, most, a lot of our writers were Star Trek fans. And they play a game on set while we're lighting where they'll pull up some music from one of the episodes and they'll just play it. And the other guy will listen to it and he'll go, okay, episode 14, the name of the show was blah, blah, blah. And he's right. And at first, I'm like, get out of here. You guys are just like, but I said, let me pick one. And sure enough, and they get it every time. I'm like, okay, yeah. that's fanatical. I mean, that's crazy. That is, <laughs> that's that next is. level fandom right there. It's but he really is a genius. I learned so much from him. And of course, it's such a weird thing that I was on it because uh, 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 Brandon Braga, who's one of our writers on 24 and one of the main writers on the Orville, he's the one that brought me in and said, come meet on the show. So I went and, you know, and I saw some of the sets and I thought it was great. And I said, now this is a, a straight out comedy, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's comedy, but with drama elements. And I said, you know, I'm the guy that like tortures people for a living, right? That's the kind of shows I do. And they were like, no, no, but we don't want comedy. Drink. We want to play it all straight up. We don't want to play the comedy beat. We want to play the drama and the comedy is incidental in that drama. And so I was like, okay, I'll give that a shot. And I wasn't on there two days and I just loved it. And I looked at Seth and I said, this is great. He goes, well, if we do if we do more, will you come back? I said, only if you give me a whole bunch of them. And of course, I was joking at the time, but it happened that way exactly. <laughs> so, so I came on as Brilliant. producing director on season two and season three. Beautiful. Um, did, did Brandon Braga do um, Farscape as well? Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know that for a fact. I, I need to check. The, na the name is so familiar. Like he's got, he's definitely got a sci-fi background. He's done that. He's done other shows. So you know, and then of course was with us on Twenty Four for many years. So yeah, I know him that way. I'll, uh, I'll just think. Um, yeah, he was a big Star Trek guy, and he did. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, the next I was Star Trek. Yeah, it was Voyager. Yeah. He did. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fair. Uh, I'm getting yeah, that and, stuff. and so oh, basically, geez. you know, he surrounded himself, uh, sets around himself with as many Star Trek people, and 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 what he loves about it the most uh, about, about doing the show is he's dealing with the kind of stories that Star Trek dealt with when it first started, you know, and even Next Generation, where they were very topical. They were what's happening in our world, and and it's always the old, you know, in sci-fi. Wouldn't it be great if it was like this? You know, but yeah. then here's the changes, here's the differences, here's the solutions. Could those be our solutions in our world with our problems? So that's what sci-fi gives you the ability to do. And he's he's a big, you know, big fan of that. No, that's what I used to love about Star Trek so much is that it would um it would encourage you to see things from different perspectives. That's like right. that's that was always the veil of sci-fi. It's like it can yeah. cloak real world issues in a sci-fi setting, but then um, it always struck a perfect balance where it encouraged the audience to think about things from different points of view and reach their own solution rather than saying like this is how you should feel about it you know that was that was the the intellect that they credited their audience with um, and I used to really mm -hmm. appreciate that appreciate that about the next generation and um, deep space nine and so on um but that no, was great stuff uh, I there's there's been quite a few questions yeah, coming in was that sorry long. Yeah. We have two um, yeah, like, oh, right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Not very good. Um, yeah, we've got obviously a, f a few thousand people watching us. So, um, yeah, there's questions coming in in the form of super chats. Um, there's definitely been a lot of love in the chat for 24. A lot of people want to start a petition to bring it back. So, there you um, go. <laughs> we need to make that happen for sure. Okay, can I just make that clear then to everybody right now that's watching? I want it back as much as you do, but I have <laughs> no say in the matter whatsoever so you can keep emailing me and or texting me or going online and you know mm -hmm. telling me to to get the show going but i have i i will know when you know when you when you hear that 24 is coming back that's when i find out too 
maybe <laughs> an hour before, but that's about it. Good, so good. We, if we if we do more rogue head. elements stuff, yeah. right, we'll we'll give Jack Bauer an appearance. That's right. We're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna, gonna give Jack with, uh, a run for his money. Just <laughs> watch his channel, basically. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll do a few of the, the questions that have come on. Um, insert username said, uh, does the drinker make a cameo in this movie? I can neither confirm nor deny that, but uh, a lot of people <laughs> watch the trailer and seem to think that I'm in it and I'm not. I'm not the guy with the sunglasses and the gun in the parking garage. Uh, yeah. that, is, that is an actor named Stephen uh, Boyle. That's his character yeah. named Kroger. Uh, and yeah, I wish I looked like him. He's been, a, he's been hitting the gym pretty hard. Um, you guys had the same hairline, so I think that's what it was. I know, dude. I like your look. I'm ready to cast you. I like your look. That's <laughs> okay. I'm a horrendous <laughs> actor, so. <laughs> uh, Lord Vulcan says, Hail Drinker and Hail Travis. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Schneeps, uh, Sheep Snatch says, That trailer shot panning around Anya uh, didn't need to go as hard as it did. Great to see the. Um, what's that? Deuterogenist of the series got so well realized. Cheers. Uh, sorry, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation there, but uh, I think uh, what he's saying is he really liked that shot of Anya in the prison cell, and then it transitions oh, yeah. to her uh, really in the real world, which was quite cool. Um, Ghost in the Craig says, thank you all for bringing Ryan Drake to life. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, the Outcast creative said, John Kassar, you're back. Not only an incredible talent, but someone of good character. It's so rare in our industry. I wish you uh, will smash this. Or sorry, I know you will smash this. Good. So you're watching for sure. Good. We got you. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One at a time. We're going to get them all. Uh, Alex says, although I love 24, Forsaken is my favorite work of yours, John. Awesome oh. work. Glad to see you with the drinker. Thank you. Forsaken's a, a Western that I did with uh, Donald and Kiefer Sutherland playing father and son. So you can you can catch it on a lot of streamers now. Check it out. We had a great cast. We had Brian Cox, we had Michael Wincott, and we had Demi Moore, who did a, just an amazing yeah. job in it. Just fantastic. So yeah, it's uh, I'm very proud of that. It's something. It's funny because again, it has a 24 connection. Almost everything does for me. Uh, it was it was, <laughs> kind of, it was kind of the film that that Kiefer and I would talk about again in between lighting setups. We were just like, "What kind of film do you want to make? I want to make Western. Me too. I want to make a Western too. Let's let's make a Western when we're finished with this." You know, it's like we talked about it all the time. And I don't know how many people know this, but Kiefer was an actual rodeo star. He has buckles, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever championship buckles from from being a rodeo star. So, mm -hmm. and he had his own ranch at one point with heads of cattle and the whole thing. So, so he was a very natural guy to to do it. And he always wants to do a movie. With with his dad you know before sort of yeah. his dad finished his career he wanted to do a movie so they play father and son it's, it's an amazing performance from both of them it really truly is that's is, that is okay. awesome uh, thank you i'm happy you saw that movie thank you uh big worm says hail to all the trailer was awesome the whole family's excited to see the result bring on kasar huge uh my wife and i loved 24 when it aired we reached rewatched it all just recently with our sons still awesome nice thank Good. you man thank you um marine lad says 24 season five was top notch will there be one more season once again <laughs> <laughs> i wish there would be but i have no you know it, it's hard to, for people to understand that you know that the rights are owned by fox and they're the only ones that have the ability to bring it back quite honestly they own the rights and so that's how that's how it works in the entertainment business and you know, they, they own the rights and, and them and the original creators, Joel Cernow, uh, uh owns the rights of it. So when those guys decide to bring it back and Fox decides to bring it back, then it'll be back. Fair enough. Um, Casey Boyd says, John, if 24 comes back, will it be more tooled up for a modern audience? <laughs> That's what we see a lot in the industry. Um, we're we're going to remake this movie for a modern audience. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's... Look, at the end of the day, it's the story. It's always going to be the story. They want us to do a movie at one point. Uh, There's a, a great little fact that a lot of people know. It was going to be a movie with uh, with Die Hard and 24 mixed together. It was like oh. both Fox wow. properties. And it you know, it <laughs> kind of fell apart at the end of the day. It never, it never happened. But, but so, yeah, I mean, it, it's trying to find a story. Remember, we did 10 seasons of this show. You know, we did 10 seasons. We did a, a TV movie, you know, the one we did in Africa. 
We did a lot. And, and part of it, part of the biggest problem is you want to have a personal connection with, with, you know, with the keeper's character, with, with Jack Bauer. And, and you want that personal connection to be something where he cares about. Look, it's the biggest, I think the biggest success of that show is the fact that, that his daughter was missing in L.A. in the middle of the night. And if anybody knows L.A. and downtown in the middle of the night and have a daughter... Yeah. That's yeah. the scariest thing you could ever forget the terrorists. That's the scariest thing in the world. And so that's part of it. And we killed his wife. His daughter's gone. His father was there. His brother was killed. <laughs> it's like his girlfriends, some of them didn't make it through. <laughs> it like, it's, uh, it's, 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 He's it's a dangerous man to know. The hardest things. So, like, you know, how far can we push it? How many relatives can we kill before, you know, he just runs out of people and, and girlfriends? So, I mean, I'm joking about it, but but in essence, that becomes a problem. True. That's why a lot of shows eventually end because you just run out of good stories to tell with the same character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always remember Alicia Cuthbert as his uh, as his daughter. Excellent casting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. She was wonderful. Too. Very very nice. Yeah. She, was, she was so young. She was like 17 when they did that. Oh really? First, Gosh. Yeah, super young. Super yeah. young and a Canadian talent also. The whole family was Canadian, by the way. It was very funny. Kiefer, mm -hmm. Leslie Hope, and, and Alicia were all yeah. Canadian. And Leslie Hope, believe it or not, has become a, an amazing director and and is oh, coming wow. to work on my show. She's coming to work with me on organized crime uh, within the next month or so. And so is Carlos oh. Bernard. So for the twenty four fans, come watch organized crime. I haven't, yeah, I haven't actors, seen him in a direct quite. Role. Yeah, I haven't seen Carlos in quite a while, actually. Um, yeah, it's not because he's become a director. He's been directing now for a while. Ah, and okay. He's doing a great job. And they love him in the wolf world. He does. Uh, he did. And she just FBI. The FBI that just aired, I think, two weeks ago was was his, his mm -hmm. episode. He did a great job on it. Um, next question was um, uh, from Marine Lad. Says, John, do you have a season of 24 that you rewatch or that you prefer over the others? Which character... <laughs> uh, did you kill off that you wish you'd given it another season? Also, Chloe is a great character. He's good. I I didn't want to kill off anybody because they're my friends. You know that's that's a <laughs> thing. I know I'd always get like I'd get online and people are like, oh, you killed off and my favorite character. I said, wait, you're killing off a person that I love. That's my friend. I've been with them for two years now, and I get, don't get to see them every day. You think you have it hard? <laughs> Harder for me. I have to say goodbye <laughs> to these people. You know, and so. Yeah, I mean, Carlos was well, Carlos. We killed him. We brought him back, so it was it wasn't too bad. But a, a lot of those people, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of them that we killed off was really tough, especially the ones that have, had been there for a few years. Favorite character, it's so hard. I mean, we we virtually, you know, we had, again we had a great casting department, uh, Deb, Debbie Manwiller, and she she just brought us. We were always looking for people that were real. We, we you know, we love the character people, you know, Glenn, Glenn Morshauer, you know, Greg Itzen. Those those are the people that made the show feel real. You know, they weren't they they didn't feel like sort of movie stars pretending to be these people. They felt like the real people, and that's sort of what we based our show on. These character actors that that you know they're, they're they're the kind of faces you see all the time, but you never know where you've seen them because they're just character background actors and and. They did a great job for us. So I, I loved all those guys. I, I always liked George Mason. I think Xander Berkeley did Xander, such a great job yeah. with him. Sarah Clark. Could, yeah. You know, Nina, who they ended up they're they you know, they ended up being a couple and they have children now, which is fantastic. That is cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so yeah, I mean, all those people, they're right, they're they're still my friends. 24, we were together for a long time. Look at we were together more than most LA marriages, put it that way. So you know, we were together for 10 years. So we saw, you know, people come and go, people get married, people get divorced, lots of children. I, I, we should have kept track of how many children were born from the casting <laughs> over those years, but there were all, yeah. you know, that were born in the 24 era. So yeah, it was a family. It truly was. Yeah. Oh, for um, sure. 24 single-handedly combat and depopulation is great. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, I, I think the right people are in place on this. We can we can do it again. You know, let's let's do it again on this. That that would be, I think, all of our goal. I would love it. Um, oh, for sure. RRTNZ says, hail to Will and the, the team rogue elements. Hope that Toronto treats you well. It could be an amazing place in the summer. Also, Chuck Norris does not sleep. He waits. That is very true. Um, I, I loved being on set for, for a few days while I was out there. Um, I didn't love the mosquito bites. I did not expect that in Canada, but it <laughs> happened nonetheless. 
Um, I regret sitting out in your bar, uh, Carson, <laughs> of an evening having a few beers because, man, I, I got bitten to... You, to, they they saw that fresh blood. It. They've never seen Scottish blood before, and they went right after yeah. you. Yeah, delicious. Like, yeah, yeah, they they would. We take you up to cottage country, right, Carson? We'll take them up. There. John's John's got a cottage just north of where I am, and his mosquitoes yeah. might even be bigger. I don't know. So you should go up oh, to his. Yeah, the black flies. The black flies are, are like are like the size of birds. Oh, I have no <laughs> blood left by the end of it. Um, yeah, uh, Nathan Taylor says, "What led to bringing Tony back in season five? Uh, probably the you, probably the, the audience saying we, we, we want Tony back, please. And so no, it was fun to have him back. It, you know, it, I mean, again, Carlos is such a great guy. We, we just loved having him around the set. He was also the king of practical, practical jokes. He was really the, the king of them. Some, some classic ones actually that both, both Kiefer and I were the butt of, unfortunately, but, uh, yeah. we, we were, we were, he got us so many times. We virtually got this plan where we we're going to have, you know, a big director friend of Kiefer call him up and say that he was in Taiwan or somewhere, and you know they were doing a movie and he lost the actor. For him to jump on a plane, we'll send you a ticket and then just send them out to some country. Somewhere. And he'd, he'd get off. He'd get off, and, and there'd be a guy with a sign that just says "Ha ha, John and Kiefer." But we, we, we just thought <laughs> we never did it to him. We just thought. Oh, the, the, the best. The, the comeback would be so cruel that we just thought we don't even want to chance that. We don't even want to chance, <laughs> chance doing that to him. So we never we never did that, unfortunately. We always wanted to. No, that's too funny. Is it true that Carlos broke his ankle in season two and they, you had to like work that into the script? He did. He, he broke it. Then we had to like fake a couple of scenes where he was walking or not really walking, just standing in one place. And then we had to do a fight with a stunt double where he broke his ankle in the in the, uh, in the show, now, of course, because we worked over nine months, you know, he recovered. <laughs> yeah. You know, even though it was one day, but with a broken ankle, kind of got better by the time you know, by the time you went down a couple more episodes. Yeah, I noticed that. It's like he was on crutches, then he's kind of hobbling around, and then he's fine by the end of the season. <laughs> wow, that was a quick recovery. It was one of the hardest things. The other thing is, if you notice, we couldn't wound up. We couldn't wound anybody's face. Because if you did it, you had to like right. do it for a whole months. And 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 the woman, for example, couldn't change her hairstyle, couldn't change their nail colors or their nails. Oh. They had to be the yeah. same for ten months because that that was that was uh, the show. So you know it was one, it was one of those things. And, and the actors really got tired of wearing the same wardrobe for you know that oh, long okay. time. I bet, yeah. Well, the continuity um, nightmare. Oh, yeah. Um, Canada yeah. Plus says, "Love the Orvo. Why did season three have a ninety-minute, or sorry, have ninety-minute episodes?" That's 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 why. That's one of the reasons we went to Hulu because when Seth writes a script, he writes a story. He writes everything he thinks the story needs, and he doesn't want you know. In the network, you can't do that. You're 42, 43 minutes, what it, whatever it is. They need time for the commercials, so an hour really comes down to 42, 43 minutes, and. He just mm. wrote stories that were so big and the action was so mm. big. I think I had one that was an hour and 26 minutes and another one that was an hour and 15 minutes to my oh. episodes. But they were they were virtually movies. I mean, they were, you know, the, the, they were almost as long as a movie, an hour and a half. So that's why he wrote that. That's why he went to Hulu. He hated having these stories that he thought he wrote everything mattered like you do on a feature film. And then suddenly some executive saying, well, not some executive, just because it's on network, you would get cut six minutes out of it. You'd be like, no, I don't want to cut six minutes out of it. So that's one of the reasons we went to Hulu. Mm. Yeah. Um, Casey Boyd asks, um, John, what is more important or valuable in the making of a film, in your opinion? Is it creativity or the execution? Well, it's a combination of both, of quite honestly. You know, but but me, look at the end of the day, I'll say it over again, and I sound like a broken record, but it's a story. It's a, it, you have to have a good story to start off with. That's number one. Then you have to execute that story in a way that's that's watchable for people, and and now the visuals have to tell the same stories that the words are telling. So that's getting that combination together, you know, and then and then it has to be satisfying for an audience. So there's all of those three elements can sort of come into play, but it always starts from a good story. That's that's where that's where it is for me. The things that I love watching on TV and the movies that I love is because the stories are good. Uh, DM says RIP to Annie Vershing. Uh, she was on Bosch and Jack's girlfriend. Yeah. 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 Uh, Poor Annie. 
Yeah, we lost Annie a couple of years back. It, it's uh, it's uh, oh, no, just I think about a year. It's only been yeah. a year, and it was absolutely heartbreaking. She was very young. It was a shock to everyone. She kept it secret. She kept working because she wanted to work, and she didn't, you know, she didn't want all the attention of of having cancer and and all that that goes with it. And we all found out. I mean, most people found out. I found out just the day before because they wanted me to write something that she was, you know virtually on her deathbed and then people were shocked absolute shocked and she worked on so many shows and all the fan bases you know were you know were very supportive of her and, and her family and helping out her family with uh with a gofundme which thank you very much to everybody that did that <clears throat> and uh it's still i can't even it it still breaks my heart i i i she was a favorite of mine i brought her on the show i had done a pilot actually with uh, with her called company man for fox while we were still shooting 24 and it didn't go. And so when we were looking for a, you know, a female partner for, for Jack, we had all sorts of names and some, you know, some movie star names are being, and I just worked with her and Joel and Joel worked with her too, because Joel wrote the pilot and we both loved her in that show and thought she'd be great. And she didn't disappoint. She was wonderful. She was a, the perfect foil for, for uh Kiefer Sutherland's character. Yep. But no, very sad, very sad. Um, Jobless Dane says, "Drinker, I'm out of antidepressants, so you and beer will have to do." Here's to you. <laughs> Thank you, man. Um, <laughs> DM, beer is always the answer. Uh, DM <laughs> says, "John, would you be up for doing uh, a Firefly reboot with Nathan?" Sure. First of all, up for anything. So there you go. But but yeah, Firefly was a fantastic show. It was a fantastic show, and it went off way too early. It's it's still its fan base is is is, is still strong and wants it to come back. And Nathan's a great actor. I, I never worked with him, but I've met him a couple of times. He's a lovely, lovely man, and everyone you know that's worked with him has just said the nicest things about him. So yeah, sure, <laughs> call me. <laughs> uh, Bloke says, "Drinker, any room for Maggie Q?" Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? Maggie's uh, awesome CJ. too. I worked I worked with yeah. Maggie also. Yeah. yeah. Um, CJ I says, know, I appreciate, oh, yeah. on that. Uh, uh, I appreciate seeing the writer of the source material being involved in the live adaptation, as opposed to it being takeover by another person who just wants to subvert expectations and add in the message. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, we're in a, a very unusual and fortunate position here where, you know, I've been working very closely with Carson and Travis, um, you know, to get this thing made. And so they were very receptive to my ideas even the dumb ones and um you know it's it's great it's just a wonderful collaborative process i know it doesn't always work like that but we've been lucky in the way things have uh, panned out so hopefully we can keep doing it that way um it, it's a huge plus i gotta tell you to have you involved is 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 a big plus it's, it really is it's a big yeah. plus. it's a it's a surreal experience when I'm on set, right, and I'm talking to like the lead actor who's playing line, Ryan Drake, and he's, um, you know, he's asking me all these questions about the character and like his personal history and what motivates him and where his his heads at at this point in you know his character's arc, um, and you know this this was a character that only existed in my head up until that point, you know, and it was just you know I, I would write my book and then it gets sent off to the publishers and that's it and that's the the way it worked but now i've got a person who wants to know about him and who's playing him and it's you know he's right in front of me it's a strange experience but it's awesome at the same time you know <laughs> i loved it um so hopefully i gave him a halfway decent answer as well um, <laughs> and look for filmmakers it. then for filmmakers there's nothing better than than being able to go right to the source i mean it's it's there's there's no guesswork involved you know you go right to you. It's it, there's nothing yeah. better, especially for a director, right, Travis? I mean, I think you'd agree. You know. Yeah. The, well, what was really cool about the script writing process is like we came up with our draft of what we wanted to do, and then I would put some placeholder dialogue in there and say, "Hey, like I think this is kind of what they would say, but how would Ryan say it, or how would you know Frost say it, right. or whatever?" And then Will would come back with the dialogue and. What was also very interesting is Will is a novelist and I've written scripts. And so when he would come back, he would write it as like a novel. And then I would have to take that. <laughs> and like, yeah. 
condense that down and and be yeah. like, okay, the actor will figure out ninety percent of this in their movement and facial tics right. and stuff. And, yeah, because uh, I'm I'm super like you know he turns his head slightly to look at you know, like Frost or whatever you know because I want to like micromanage every aspect and it's like no you have to trust the actor. Like, like, I do that in the book. You have to do yeah. that in a book. You don't have a choice, but that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting combo of the two of you together like that. No, it's it's a learning process for sure. But uh, you know, you gradually pick it up as you go. But it's great fun. It's great to like have that new challenge of doing something a very different way. So um, yeah, it's great. Actually, I have a question for you. Then would, would you like as you're writing new books, do you start thinking about them like, hmm, how would this look in in a TV show? Would you start thinking that way? You think? I, I I probably would. I mean, when I write my books, I always kind of picture them as a movie anyway. Like I almost imagine oh, yeah. the angle yeah. that I'm viewing the characters from and how I see this scene playing out. So I try and picture it as a film, and that helps me to describe how it's how they're acting right. and what they're yeah. thinking and that sort of thing. So uh, it's not too big of a leap. It's just the the style that you do it in. You've got to be a bit more economical, obviously, when you're doing a screenplay. Right. Right. What hooked me yeah, actually to go to talk to you, Will, in the first place was uh, the first chapter of the second book was what really hooked me. The the helicopter sequence. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was like it was very cinematic to me. That and that's where it was like okay. And then that's I like just gobbled up the rest of the series before I called you or emailed you. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that was cool, man. Yeah. It was great when you got to certain points as well in the the books because like there was a couple of like character deaths or whatever, and you would just message me like, "You son of a bitch! I can't believe you did that." <laughs> 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 it's funny because we virtually do the same thing. I mean, Travis, I'm sure you do the same thing, and Carson, you too. When we read a book, I'm making the movie already. I'm already yeah. seeing the angles and seeing, you know, yep. what I'm gonna do. And every time I read a book, I'm doing the same thing. So, I mean, that's why reading your, that first book of yours was so. I, I made that movie already. It's in my head, you know. Nice. So it's okay. just, it's, and and basically the, the books that, the books I like are the ones that I make good movies in my head. <laughs> Quite honestly. Well, I'll take Absolutely. that as a good sign. Absolutely. Um, Robert Barossa says, Mia Kirscher as Mandy was my favorite character on 24. She was an excellent villain. She was the one that blew up that plane in the in the, in the the first episode. Mm -hmm. The yep. first few episodes. Yeah, and then the, I think we brought her back again. And I think she also poisoned the president by shaking his hand with poison on her hands. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff we came up with all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Charlie May says, speaking of LA, um, who gets the final say, writers or producers? For, I, imagine for it's I, I imagine it's for uh, TV it'll, shows in, or movies. What aspect? Uh, I, I can only read what he's saying. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a collaboration. I mean, you know, the, the writers yeah. write the script and then the directors, even in, in network television, you collaborate. You're still, you're still going back and forth. You know, especially mm -hmm. in television where you're writing them as quickly as you're writing them, you're writing them week by week. I mean, we're we're getting scripts, you know, they're just being we're so we're prepping some of our shows with an outline and the script isn't even ready yet, and we're ready prepping our shows. I mean, and, and that's not unusual. It's not great to, to have that, but again, we're used to it in television, it's what we do. So so then you have to go back and, and work with the writer and say, Oh, this doesn't really make sense, that doesn't work. And so it's a collaboration, but look. I don't take anything away from someone that can look at a blank piece of paper and write a story. It's not an easy thing to do. Not everyone can do it. Uh, I'm a director and I love directing, but I can't do that. I can help a script. I can fix a script. I can make suggestions on a script. I can shoot a script. I just can't mm -hmm. look at a blank piece of paper and write one. And I just, you know, came to terms with that, you know, very early in my career. But uh, I, I know how to fix one and help help a writer with one. That's what we do as directors. All directors do that. Um, and lips way your TV's yeah. working too. Sorry, yeah, your yeah. revisions are so, your revisions are so fast, John. Too that you have to adapt even from the writer because your revision, revision, right just before, a couple yeah. days before you shoot. You know? Directing television is its own beast that people don't really understand. It's very different than directing movies. And I've you know directed yeah. a couple of movies, which was you know in one way almost simple in comparison to what we do in television. It's truly right. a moving train. You know, if you think about, you know, a blank piece of paper with words on it that comes to you, you know, and seven days later, you're rolling cameras. Seven yeah. days. You've found yeah. all the locations. You've cast it. You've built sets. You've done all that. You've done the revisions. You've done all that. And you're rolling camera. Eight days later, you're finished. 
post does four or five days after that and you have a one hour show it's it's unbelievable <laughs> that is crazy how fast about that works when you think about it it's crazy it's absolutely crazy um also john um i i obviously don't want to prevail upon your time too much um it like my audience here has got lots of questions for everyone here uh yeah i, I just don't want to in this blank hotel room in near in brooklyn yeah so. yeah i just don't want to take take too much of your time in case you had other stuff but if you're okay to answer a few more questions that would be yeah, awesome because there's people are sending them in um, pretty absolutely. rapidly uh says uh, cheesy lips says please save jack bauer from the russians <laughs> <laughs> they're working on that we're gonna send chloe in yeah uh casey boyd says who's the panel's favorite or most inspirational director what film made you think that's what i want to do for my career uh my answer was uh way back when i was uh i was in film school a long time ago there was a lot of film kids that were trying to impress the instructors by giving off like auteur type directors and i <laughs> said Michael Bay because he blows shit up. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? See, and I just, you're the only, you're the and you're the one that became a director. There you go. That tells it. <laughs> that tells it all right there. And uh, my, I've, got, I've, got, I've got so many, but again, I'm I'm my favorite directors are the populist guys, the guys that move make movies for people. You know, right. and, and I can appreciate directors that make the other kind of movies, the ones that are auteur and 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 you know art based movies i get it i i i can watch them they're just not my favorites that's all so yeah. you know I, i'm spielberg scorsese uh you know those are the guys that 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 i love and and make the movies uh, danny boyle fantastic oh, he made for amazing. luke bisson i mentioned already these are the guys that just keep making you know better like uh, ridley scott uh, just one movie after another they just have unbelievable catalogs of movies that i love and so they're they're, they're my they're my heroes yeah and i mine is norman jewison of course is, is uh, norman 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 jewison. Jewison. You have to work with them that's the great part yeah well i work I, yeah sure i have the opportunity and, and i'm fortunate to work with him but the, the stuff that he did breaking barriers all the way back and cultural barriers and and, and his oh my god I, I just can't get into it right now because that's a whole hour's talking book. Yeah, yeah he was, he was uh, you know, Stanley Kubrick, you know, same thing. I mean, there's yeah. just so many great directors. Yeah, those, those are the guys too. I love the guys like like those are two perfect examples, Kubrick and and uh, and uh, sorry, the name just fell out of my head. Uh, Jason, yeah, the same director you're just talking about. Oh my god. I'm just, I got so many directors in my head. Right Norman Jewison is beautiful. Yep. Yeah, Norman, what's great about those guys, if you see their, their, just look on Letterboxd, if you guys don't know what Letterboxd is, my favorite app in the world, but but just look on Letterboxd and just see the see the posters of those two guys and how they did a different genre almost yeah. every single time. Yeah, <laughs> everything. Mean, Jewison did, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar, this crazy musical that was just so crazy for its time. Did the Russians are coming? The Russians are coming. Yes. Oh, you yes. Know, did uh, uh, on the roof. Heat of the night. You know, I mean, and then yep. you look at Kubrick. It's the same thing. He makes a war movie. He makes a horror. He makes a sci-fi. And mm. these are these are amazing directors that just go, okay, I did that. Now let me try this, which yeah. I always just find inspiring. Yeah. Mm. Um. That's the next one. So, uh, Big Daddy MRI says, "You guys are amazing. Thank you very much." Um, <laughs> I love that uh, one. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Sure, it's sweet. Uh, DM says, "Drinker, has any critic been critical of your content?" I mean, I'm sure there has been. Like, there's always, you know, this is the wonderful world of YouTube, everyone. Like, oh, yeah, uh, this, is, this is what the internet has brought us all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, no matter what you do, someone's going to be critical of it. So I say, let them do it. It's fine. Uh, there are a few in the in your comments already before I even started when you just announced I'm, um, I was there. <laughs> was oh, yeah. yeah. Of my you early know. days, I guess, when I was doing, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan movies. But, hey, they got me to here. And and maybe they didn't like my Baywatch nights. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, but you got, work, you got to work with Carl Weathers in that movie. Carl Weathers in that movie. Yeah. What a, oh, movie. Oh, yeah. and a friend of mine and... and Again, a very sad one, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and yeah, totally that shocking. shocked all of us. Yeah, you know, like I, he, saw, he... I saw him about a year ago, and he gave me a hug after we had dinner to say goodbye. I, I swear to God, I couldn't even breathe. The guy was still made of <gasps> iron. I swear to God, yeah. he was made of metal. He's, wow. He was so fit, so strong, <clears throat> and so yeah, it's, it was a real shocker. 
That's a real I mean, you've got a chance to work with a lot of people that we lost in the last couple of years, which is very sad. I mean, I you, you did the Kennedys, when you did the Kennedys, you know, working, you know, we, we, we lost some great people in that, uh, you know, yeah. like, you know, and it's amazing that in the last couple Matthew of years, Perry. We, Matthew I Perry, I, Matthew I Perry played Teddy Kennedy in the, in the second version of the Kennedys I did, yeah. you know, and that was not too long ago. That's a couple of years back. It's, it's actually the last thing he did. Was was play that part? That was his. Last oh, was part. it? I didn't know that. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was really sad. He was the nicest wow. nicest guy in the world, you know. And and oh, again, fighting his addictions and was in a really good place when we did the Kennedys. He was really cleaned up and, you know, and told me all about sort of his life and, and that. And yeah, very sad. Yeah. Very very yeah. sad. And Tom yeah. Wilkinson is who wow. you're talking about in the Kennedys who played Joe Tom Kennedy. Wilkinson. Tom Wilkinson. Yeah. I mean, what an actor! Unbelievable. Yeah. He's brilliant. It's been, been a tough twelve months. It really has. Been a, been a, for everybody. Lots of lots of unbelievable, you know, pe people. Unfortunately, it's sad. Um, Norwegian Kryptonian says they should have made a Supergirl movie starring Alicia Cuthbert. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a shame because like, I feel like she didn't go on to huge things necessarily, and I've not seen her yeah, much recently. You know, sometimes and... it's sometimes, you know, I, I don't know her management, her agents, but sometimes it's it's making those right decisions that makes all the difference in the world, you know, just taking those right parts. When you do have a little bit of fame and you got a little bit of heat, Carson, you can, you know, talk about some of this too with actors. This is what happens. And so yeah. at that point, especially when you're young, you need good management to sort of find the next role. You know, and, and maybe not have it be so big, maybe just smaller, but it, you build and you build and you build and you build a career by taking the right choices. And I just, I, I agree with you. Uh, she just took really bad choices coming out of 24 when she had the heat to, you know, to to get good movies. And unfortunately, she's a good, she's a good little actress. I got to tell you, she's very impressive. I, I, I really liked her and I thought she did good work. But unfortunately, just some of those roles were just not not right. Yeah, it's too bad. That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to find a role for her, and we'll bring her back. That's right. I'm real. still in touch with her. We'll, we'll bring her back. <laughs> she could be Anya. She's she got the right age back. for her now. So. She could be an Anya. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And right, Carson, we know that she's married to a hockey player, so that's yeah, how there you go. Be. Yeah, there you go. Speaking of that, what time's the lease starting? We've got to make sure we make <laughs> a mistake. John and I are big uh, Toronto Maple Leafs fans yeah. for the rest of the country. We, we're diehards. Right. Since, yeah, I didn't Stop tell you. <laughs> Stop Some people fun. might criticize us for that, but uh, John, so up here where I live, Johnny Bauer is my next door neighbor. Unfortunately, he passed away, but he was yeah, my neighbor up here for many years, when, and he was the last gentleman to win the Stanley Cup. So <laughs> that shows you how long we've been John, waiting. Johnny Bauer was a goalie, for those that don't know hockey, that used to play a net without a mask in those <laughs> days. Wow. And I remember, actually, when I was a kid going to a hockey game. This is in the 70s, early 70s. Yep. I saw them win the Stanley Cup, by the way. But I mean, that was the last time. That was we won't tell him what year it was then that, that they won years ago. <laughs> but I remember walking beside him. He was like, you know, walking in the hallways. This is after he retired. And someone <laughs> said, It's Johnny Bauer. And I went up to get his autograph and I looked at his face, and his whole face was one giant scar tissue. <laughs> Just from all the pucks that <laughs> penetrated his skin. He virtually looked like Frankenstein. Oh. As a kid, I was like horrified. I was like, oh my God, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> little did I know yeah. he was taking pucks to the face. There's not a lot of hockey down there, Will, where you are. So us, us Canadians, you know, that's that's our favorite pastime to talk about. <laughs> no, to be fair, I just watched Scotland kick England's ass at rugby today. So all right, I'm happy okay. today. <laughs> it's a good day. I became I became a rugby fan when I went to when when I went to Australia and, and London. We, we both we, we started. I started watching rugby. Got a whole new appreciation for that game once you go to a couple of games. It's it's good. It's very stop and start, but uh, yeah. well, man, like American but, football is too. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah, they they don't wear armor to do it. So no, it's, they're, they're, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Wait, was that a dig to us? I'm not sure. <laughs> not yeah, not in the slightest. It totally was. I uh, know. <laughs> moving on, uh, Cos Billingham says, uh, "Can I now say uh, that I knew you before you were cool? Uh, been here since 300k, and it's been a joy to watch you grow, both as a channel and as a person. Thank you. Uh, although I'd like to think I'm just as much an immature asshole as I was back then when I started. So <laughs> I think we all are, aren't we? Is, is it going to be hiding that? <laughs> we just get better at hiding it, you know. Hiding that." 
Ed <laughs> Dowen says, now that 20th century, sorry, 20th century Fox is owned by Disney, is there any hope for a 10th season of 24? Um, I, yeah, that's a good question, actually. I suppose now that Disney own the rights to all Fox's properties, I don't know what they might do with it. Um, they're quite big on, um, on you know, relaunching things, remaking things. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you would just get like an entirely revamped version of 24 if they were to do it. Um, but I wouldn't want to see it without Jack Bauer, man. That's I wish I had more right. information for you. I really do. But I don't have any more information than what, what you've read and heard. <clears throat> hey, I got Jack Bauer right here. There you go. There he is. Hey. Bye, buddy. Nice. <laughs> um, Stitch says, John Kassar, this is a fantastic team up, and I'm looking forward to you helping Will Travis and Carson continue with Ryan Drake's journey. Yes. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it also. Uh, DM says, John and everyone, I would love to see Aaron Eckhart in your film. See, Very there's an actor, actor. I love. That, that would be great. Mm -hmm. He's yeah, such a great actor. Good choice. Good choice. He's again never, one, of those, yeah. one of those character guys that oh, yeah. I always gravitate towards. Yeah, never quite yeah. found his niche as a leading man, I think, but uh, good actor all the same. Uh, I yeah. mean, he did it. He did in some films, but not the kind of films that everyone goes see. You know, he he did some great. He did some yeah. great work. Um, and Penbrook's own says, "Yes, Team Rogue. Great to see you uh, this come together. Uh, what's been the hardest or the best part of adapting an IP and putting onto screen?" Drinker, you're an inspiration to indie writers everywhere. Can't wait to see it, lads. Thank you. And um, yeah, Travis could probably, uh, and yeah, Carson could probably correct. answer this better than I can. What's the hardest part of adapting it? Uh, so for me, one of the hardest parts was the fact that we were kind of marrying this like indie world with like the pros. And it's, uh, they're two very different um kind of ways of doing the same thing so my background like i've done tons of my own short films and stuff like that and and, and not like low budget ones either and but i'm used to like if there's a c stand that needs to be moved i'm used to being able to pick that up and move it or you know if, if uh, i notice that something's out of place in the background i can go move it and not get yelled at and like i knew going in that that was i wasn't going to be allowed to do any of that stuff but it was still hard to you know hold those impulses um back and then of course the other thing with filmmaking is there's a lot of hurry up and wait and so this is probably the biggest project i've personally worked on so uh you know getting antsy in that i was so i guess one of my favorite days on set was there was a really slow day and i knew it was coming up so uh i wrote a whole other film in uh, the night before <laughs> messaged the actor who was going to be on set and was like hey do you want to shoot this with us while we're in between oh my God. <laughs> and, then, and then we went and shot something else so we weren't just sitting around i virtually have told that as a joke i, I was like this has been so long i can shoot another film in between you actually did it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, the pace, the pace is a little different in uh, mainstream, Travis, than what you're used to of going yeah. crazy. Right? Hey, yeah. Travis, I'm still in that world of doing everything myself because I come, I come from a, I don't come from independent movies, but I come from documentaries and you know, right. your whole crew and equipment fit in a minivan. That's what I'm used to. So the yeah, hundred percent and stuff, I'll never get used to them. As, as in thirty years being directing these crews, they're still too big for me. You know, yeah, it feels, I'm the it kind of guy that goes like this. I kind of I go, see this bottle, guys. Can you get this bottle and move it over here? Okay, great, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will say, I, I go, never I told you. Oh, sorry, I did it. It's okay. I, we, uh, don't, I'm, we don't I'm need set there. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry sure Travis. I never right? sat down. I, I just I, I'm the type of director that can't sit in a chair either. Like I have to be like in yeah. there yeah. as close to the action as possible and uh same thing. So that, look, that was all for watch. I look at my watch and I think we were on one set today and I did 20,000 steps. I think, how is <laughs> yeah. that even possible? <laughs> like, it's just one room. <laughs> I never sat down. I talked to my actors after every take. You know, I, I'm not a guy that <laughs> the monitor and screams at people that anyone can tell you that. I like to Good. talk to the actors privately, not in front of everybody. So Good. I'm the Good. same thing. And I also feel, don't you feel, Travis, that if you're sitting, it feels like everyone goes a little slower. That's what 100%. I find. I find yeah, if you're 100%. not looking around and fixing things, then it just feels like you're going slower to me. So I'm just, I'm always moving. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I think people kind of, like that kind of mentality trickles down. So if you're the top yeah. guy on the, on the set that day and you're just kind of sitting there, I think other people 
take that cue to be a little bit slower. But if you're in the dirt and you're you're mucking around, uh, then I find there, I'm there with you. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one other one here. Um, Essamon says, "Have any of this panel watched the Canadian comedy Letterkenny?" Yes, it's oh, yeah. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah, so if you haven't watched your friend that, he was the uh, was one of the directors. Yeah, it, yeah he it's, worked. It's, he worked on. Uh, he came to do a day workshop, actually. Very cool. Uh, that, what what I love too okay. about I'm having uh, internet Canadian television now. What I love about streaming is this Canadian television that us Canadians have known for years and and love is getting out there to the rest of the world, which is really really great to see. Mm -hmm. You know that that the, these shows are now getting out to to people that didn't even know Canadians did television, quite honestly, for a long time. So yeah. it's great to see these shows getting, you know, some some respect finally, because they are good shows. 100%. Not just um, the beachcombers anymore. No. No. <laughs> That's a deep Canadian cut. Travis, you're too young for the beachcombers. You know no, that? I watched the beachcombers. Oh, I, had channel, I had Channel 4. I watched that. Come on. <laughs> always better than uh, Bernard Tracy. <laughs> Um, his, daughter, says, his daughter is one of our best casting agents, Tina. She she brings me in all the time. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. One of our best. Yeah. Does all the big shows. Uh, Casey Boyd says, what advice would you give for people interested in behind the scenes work? VFX, CGI, writing, cameras, etc. It seems rough because they don't make as much. What do you mean don't make as much? Yeah. They don't make as much as what the actors and directors you, you mean is that okay? I, I i assume so yeah i assume maybe they don't make as much as the guys in front of the camera well, look the best advice anyone will tell you is go to school like every other thing like every other profession that you need to to learn the the nuts and bolts on and that's i went and it doesn't have to be usc and ucla it doesn't have to be big film schools i come from a little school in ottawa canada a college a two-year course you know and then i worked my way up so it, but getting that base is good. And the best thing about those two years, not only did it sort of, again, teach me the nuts and bolts of making television, but it connected me with people that were in the business already. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest plus of, of going to these colleges and schools because the teachers mm. were guys that were out there still working. So my first jobs were all with the guys that were already teaching me. And that was my first connection in trying to get a connection in when, you know, nobody in the business is really difficult. It's very hard to start, you know? And so, so that's, that's my advice to everybody. Go to college, go, go to, there's, there's now film schools everywhere. You know, in my day, there weren't that many, quite honestly. Now there isn't a single college or university that doesn't have some kind of film production course, you know? And it, again, it doesn't have to be the big, the big two or the big, or NYU, it doesn't have to be those. If you can do those, great, they're great schools. But it, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be successful by going to those schools. It's still a lot of work after that. That's the yeah, it's a, it's a lot, like I find at the start, it, it does start with who you know, but then yeah. that goes away pretty quick when people know if you can do, <laughs> if, if you have some talent or not. That's right, that's right. Then, it, then it's your talent and, and, and your attitude, which is also 100%. huge. You know, yeah, like my like for example, my my story is is uh, same thing. I went to film school in Vancouver, and I went there, and I was one of the older <laughs> at the time. I was one of the older guys in class, right? So I took it very seriously, and I made sure to know all my instructors because I knew those guys going forward. That's would be right, exactly the same. Would yeah. get your foot in the door, and uh, I made the decision because it could I could have easily stayed in Vancouver and 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 gone the route of, of grinding and, and doing all that stuff. But I'm so creative with writing and, and just felt the need that I needed to do my own stuff that felt like I had to go that route instead. But like a lot of the guys that I was in school with, they're now all like cam ops or, or like Bjorn who DP would the show. He's a steady cam operator now. And, uh, yeah. and uh, he does a lot of DP work on, on, on shows and Great. yeah. It's all who you know and how good you are, just like you said. But again, it's a schooling really does help, and yep. and it'll 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 prove to you whether you should be doing it or not. If if you can't mm -hmm. if you can't be top of your class in those classes, I mean, look, I was never great at school. I I, I was a C a C average, the best. <laughs> but the second I got to college, and I was in in those days, it was radio and television. Believe it or not, <laughs> the first year you had to do both, and I just. I'll never forget this. I went to the radio teacher and said, look, you can talk to all the teachers. I'm going to kill it here in TV. This is what I want to do. This is my life. 
do me a favor. I don't want to waste time in your radio course. Just give me a C. Just pass me. Whatever <laughs> I, do, just pass. I don't want to spend any time here. And the guy goes, boy, you're the most honest student I've ever had. You got, you got a deal. <laughs> so, nice. Everything I put in, he'd come back and say, that is the worst project I've ever seen. <laughs> and I was like, good, thanks. He said, it looks like you did it in 10 minutes. I said, yeah, I did. <laughs> That's the um, editing and sneaking into the edit suites, you know. So, but yeah, was, and and that's that's a big part of it is that there you know right away if you're top of your class, you've got a crack at this. If if you're not getting it and you're not loving it and you're way down at the bottom, don't try to get in the film business because if you can't make it out of college, you yeah, know, with some kind of success, you're already in trouble. That's the, yeah. that's the reality. I also find it teaches you a lot of people when they go in, they think they want to be a director, but they learn all these different disciplines that yes. they're better suited for and have like really good, strong careers based around that. Yeah. And in fact, um, I, when I, I do, I do like talks at USC and UCLA, it's one of the first things I do because, you know, you do one of those auditoriums with a hundred kids and I say, who wants to be, you know, who wants to be a director, you know, hundred kids put their hands up. And right away I go, okay, you keep your hands up and you over there, you too. And I go, that's your percentage. And they boo me right away because they all want to be directors. And I said, look, I'm only telling you that because you shouldn't be discouraged if you don't end up being a director. You know, I mean, I was a, I was a camera operator for 10 years. I probably would have been happy to be an operator my whole life. It's a great job. And so it's not just about being a director. It's it's a very small percentage of people that direct. It really is. But there are another hundred great jobs in the business. And you're still part of a team that's making movies and television, which is so satisfying as a job. It's the best job there is. And so you, there's so many other jobs you can do. So keep your mind open. Don't, don't just yeah. want to be a director. Uh, here's one. Um, hello, Mr. Kassar. Um, has the transition from film stock to digital video helped to improve the workflow in television production? I don't I don't think so. I mean, I, again, that's a part of the business I don't know that much about, quite honestly. You know, I, I shoot the film or I shoot the video, whatever it is, I, I pass it on. And then there's a huge chain of, of, you know, things that happen by the time it gets back to me in dailies. So, I, I no, think there's exactly. a simplicity to it. I don't think it's any cheaper than it was, quite honestly. I think all those costs go up anyways. Uh, but I think what what it's done, what I what I love about the the move to HD, and you know, I mean, I come from a video background anyways because I was doing news and industrials and all of that. So that's how I started anyways. But what's great about it is, especially if you're a young filmmaker, any of you out there today, can make a movie in the next week or so and have a million people watch it online. Yep. Yep. We never had that as kids. We made yeah. our little great movies that the whole audience of my family got to see. And <laughs> a couple of my aunts and uncles, and that was it, you know, and we'd have to cut the film and glue it together. You guys have your phone now you can make an amazing movie with. You know, you got a yeah. 4K phone. So, but here's the interesting part. There still isn't a million movie makers coming out now that they got the right equipment, which shows you that all these years where everyone was like, well, if I had a film camera, I'd be a great director and I'd be a great cinematographer. It's not the camera. It's not the equipment. It's the stories that you're telling and the stories yeah. that you want to tell. And the, the mechanics of the camera First means time. nothing. You know, so you're you're if you are a young filmmaker and you want to make films, you've got it there. It's in the palm of your hand right now. But find a story that's good good for you, first of all, that's something you really have a passion for, and maybe a story that the, the population is going to like, which is going to make that, that's, that your film go a little further. You know, those are the two things you should be looking for. And please, don't make something that's already out there. You know, if I, if I see another 24, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's great that you're like, in, in one way, sort of giving it a, a pat on the back and saying, here's my version of 24, but 24 is 24. Don't make 24. Make something new and make something different that'll catch someone's attention. And that's more important than trying to just copy something that's out there already. So there you go. There's my my film school advice. I, I wish yeah. the Hollywood studios would take that advice yeah. on board. Like, man, the amount of like remakes and stuff that we've seen in recent yeah, years I has mean, been horrendous. Even though even they don't know that rule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
This is this is an interesting question, actually. Jeff Peterson says, when you fellows are speaking to normies about the craft of storytelling and filmmaking, etc., what is your feedback to someone who conflates enjoyment with something being well crafted or well written? So essentially, I like this film, therefore it's great, rather than I want to be a bit more objective and break down what makes it good. Like the the is the script really good? Is the directing like well put together? That sort of thing. So like how do you how do you separate those two things? Because it is, a, it is as a film reviewer, like even in the limited capacity that I do it on YouTube, it's something that you try to get across to people. Like just because something's popular doesn't necessarily mean that it's good, like or that it's well made. There's a there's a difference there where you have to be more objective about it. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone looks at it differently, and of course, you know, look, people never talk about age too. Like if, if I, I've got on Letterbox, I got my, my favorite 175 films. I started at 10 and I kept going, oh, well, no, this one's got to be there. Oh, no, this one's got to be there. Oh, yeah. I'm at 175 because <clears throat> mostly because you can't compare them with each other. You know, I mean, I have The Godfather on there, but I also have The Three Amigos. Now, <laughs> you try to tell me which is a better film. I'm going to tell you if it's about making me laugh, The Three Amigos wins. If it's yeah. about this great story about this epic you know gangster family it's godfather so i judge films on what did the filmmaker try to do <clears throat> did he do it was i entertained and did did they do what they set out to do did they tell the story they wanted to tell that's mm -hmm. sort of how i judge films and i i i kind of try not to think about the technical part of it if, if it's a good movie i usually stop thinking about where the boom was and what kind of dolly shot it was and yeah. you know how they did the lighting i don't think about that stuff i i get totally involved in the story and if i find myself tearing up at the end they've really done their job yeah, yeah. that's a, that's yeah. a whole lot i'll finish it i'll finish up with this question here um what was it um uh, did you work on the 24 video game and if so how was it <laughs> no no that's that's a whole other <laughs> I, I i i think i own one i think i own one of those video games but i think there were a couple of different ones i think there was one where you put like a vhs in and you played along with i don't i don't oh. quite remember but i know there was yeah there was like a, a gaming a game console game but the, the problem with it is by the time the the problem is it takes so long to develop those games that by the time they they developed the 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 jack bauer one he looked like a blocky animation compared to everything else that was out there by then, you know. So <laughs> yeah. it didn't really hold up. It didn't really hold up to what else was happening. Oh, funny. Uh, well, I, I I'm kind of conscious we've been going for about an hour and a half here. Um, and guys, this is fun. It's good, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is this is the joys of live streaming. You know, a lot of people had a lot of questions they wanted to ask, and it's great because, like, you know, you get the opportunity to address all kinds of different things. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we've, we've made it to the end of the, the super chats that came through. Um, and I guess I, I would like to wrap it up by saying that, uh, it, John, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to speak with you tonight and have you on here, give everyone a chance to, to meet you and ask you questions. Um, yeah, and thank you for taking some time out of your day to come and do this. It's been much appreciated. Back at you. It was actually a pleasure just hanging out with you guys. I mean, look, you get four film people together, <laughs> television and film people, forget yeah. about it. Talk forever. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. And uh, needless to say, Travis, Carson, thank you guys for coming on tonight. Um, it's been great throughout this whole process working with you guys. And uh, it's nice now that we are. We're at the point where we can come out, as it were, <laughs> and do this stuff publicly and show people what we've been working on and talk That's about right. it again. So. We had a lot of hard work till now, but we have a, a lot more to go. But, you know, we're getting great reviews. We're getting great, you know, people saying how much they love it. So it's going to give us more drive to keep going. So, and that's yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to make something really that they enjoy and very successful. So it's going to be quite nice. Nice one. And, uh, well, everyone, you, you have seen the trailer. Um, there is more coming, obviously, in the near future. Uh, and stay tuned for more updates uh, as they come. But, uh for now, at least that is all we've got for today. So go away now. Thanks, guys. Bye, all.